uh, I've taken the lateral uh, ligament, which I'll openly admit is probably uh, less controversial than um, than the medial. Uh, but that's the uh, uh, that's the privilege of seniority, I think. So, uh, so a few disclosures here is uh, I have a potential conflict with the presentation uh, because I will mention some materials that I have uh, some um, uh, development and royalty positions in. So lateral ankle sprains, dime a dozen. Uh, uh, the thing that I think is understated is how often we have residual problems uh, after uh, an ankle injury. So Ken Hunt looked at a uh, American uh, sports experience, and this is the NCAA Division I program, uh, and this was when he was in Stanford. So they looked at uh, almost 1,100 athletes participating in 37 sports and looked over two years. And what they were interested in was the foot and ankle injuries that required medical treatment. What they found was that uh, over a quarter of all injuries were foot and ankle. So uh, we should all consider that job security. And the average loss was 12.3 days from sport. 27% uh, of these were referred for a physician evaluation and 84% had radiologic investigation. The most frequent foot and ankle injury reported in this cohort was lateral ankle ligaments. So the anterior tail of ligament is the primary restraint to inversion throughout ankle motion, and it is by far the most commonly injured. This is the one that we are gonna be focusing on uh, today. Uh, not to forget the calcaneal fibrillar ligament is the primary restraint to inversion of the dorsiflexed ankle. It's unique in that it crosses both the ankle joint and the subtalar joint. <clears throat> so when we're looking at testing, is we've got to sort out this idea of anterior drawer and anterior lateral drawer. So the anterior drawer is uh, a total combined laxity of both the tibiotalar and the subtalar joint. So that's a direct anterior pull. Whereas the anterior lateral drawer is a direct palpation of the fibula and talus, and you're trying to appreciate the rotation of the talus. So the anterior lateral drawer is more sensitive for ankle instability than the anterior drawer. So here's a typical patient for all of us. Uh, this is a 26 year old male, long history of what he'll call small ankle sprains, which means he really didn't get medical care. Uh, he plays with the brace and he thinks he's okay. Uh, he's wrestling, twists his ankle again, much worse this time. And clinically, you call this a grade two, grade three ligament tear. It's quite loose when you're examining him. His x-rays are negative. Well, clinical practice guidelines. When should we be doing an MRI? Well, we should do it if we think that this patient injured his cartilage, if we think he had a perineal tendon tear, if he's had a ligament injury, but it doesn't respond to brace, PT, or rest, or if he has normal x-rays, but you're concerned for an OCD or occult fracture. Well, it begs the question, can we just skip the physician and go to the imaging? How about using MRI to diagnose instability? So this is Joel Mann publishing in 2017, uh, 187 patients that were already scheduled for lateral ligament reconstruction. So that means a surgeon has identified them as having chronic instability, a surgeon has talked about risks and benefits, and a surgeon has recommended surgery. Well, they had a control group who had no ankle instability, but also had MRI and stress x-rays. And they gave all these patients to the radiologist to diagnose. What they found was that MRI was sensitive, but not specific. Sensitivity rate of 82%, specificity rate only 53%, positive predictive value 73%, negative predictive value 66%. And these radiologists could not pick out the ankle instability patients from MRI imaging alone. Kind of a fascinating idea. So MRI has value as a screening tool for associated ankle pathology, but it is not diagnostic, diagnostic for lateral ankle instability. Well, what are the predictors of chronic ankle instability? Well, Doherty took 82 patients who had a foot time, first time ankle sprain, and they wanted to know at two weeks, who are the ones who are going to do well, and who are the ones that are ultimately gonna end up needing surgery? And they had two things that were predictive. Inability to perform a single leg drop test, that's a little bit of a mean test where you're actually asking uh, somebody to land from a height on their injured ankle. And if they couldn't do it, 
then that's a bad prognostic sign or if they couldn't do a drop vertical jump. So those are a little bit impractical, uh, but that's what they came up with. So lateral ligament reconstructions, there's 80 or more described. There's all kinds of different categories. I tend to break them into anatomic, which are the modified brostrum or augmented brostrum or the non-anatomic, which are perhaps uh, the Christmas snow. The principles of ankle ligament reconstruction, you gotta respect the isometry, cannot over constrain joints. You have to allow for early mobilization. And I don't think you wanna sacrifice local motors. So this is what my algorithm looks like. Uh, my first go-to is an open brostrum with the ghoul. My second go-to would be an open brostrum with a ligament augment device. And my third go-to is what I'm calling the Atlas. It's an ATFL and CFL ligament reconstruction using either allograph or autograph semitendinosus, or my recent experience has been more with ligament augment devices. So let's dig into these a bit. So Brostrom Gould, I think all of us know it. The beauty of a Brostrom Gould is that it respects the normal isometry of the ankle. And in my opinion, you cannot over constrain the ankle doing this. The Gould brings in the subtalar component of it. Uh, Ken Hunt in 2008 had 10 matched cadaveric limbs and he did material testing in plantar flexion and internal rotation. He found that when you include the calcaneal fibrillar ligament, so you do the dual ligament reconstruction with Brostrom, you get increased stiffness, reduced medial translation of the subtalar joint and a higher failure torque. Well, if you're gonna do the Brostrom, where do you do it? I tend to repair the ATF and CFL mid-substance. But if you look at this paper by St. Pierre back in 1983, they found that the injury usually is closer to the talus. So at the fibula, they said none of them were at the fibula. Mid-ligament, 44%. Insertion at the talus, 50%. So my mid-substance really might only be picking up 50% of the uh, actual injury site in these patients. So... Bell published 2016 on the Brostrom. I like this because these are hardcore Navy uh, Academy recruits. They've got 26 year follow-up, 91% good to excellent. That's about as good as it gets in orthopedic surgery. 91% good to excellent. And why? I think it's because it respects all the principles of reconstruction. Well, what happened to the other 10%? Uh, was it the tissue? Was it the technique? Did the knots fail? Did the anchor pull out? or can we blame it on our patients? So tissue is the wet link, uh, the weak link. Uh, Brown Publishing in 2014 did matched cadaveric, cadaveric mechanical testing, and he did anchor versus suture only and found no difference in anything. No difference in failure torque, failure anger, or stiffness. Failure level was at the tissue level, meaning the suture pulled out of the tissue. It wasn't the suture, it wasn't the ankle, this was the tissue level. So it brings us down to the question about the compromised host. What are you gonna do? Well, I think we'll all argue in those cases, you need to augment the tissue. Lots of options. You can use autogenous sources. You can use allograft sources, depending on your local uh, ability to source that. Xenograft options or prosthetic options. And I'm gonna talk more about the uh, prosthetic options uh, today. So Porter publishing in 2019. Uh, Porter's out of Australia. He had 50 chronic ankle instability patients and he randomized them. So this is level one data. It is the first group was randomized to a modified brostrum done the way that I just described. The second group was a primary repair with a ligament augment device. At five year follow-up in 42 patients, there were two failures in the modified brostrum, none in the ligament augment group. Ligament augment group had significantly better scores at one, two and five years and the five-year Tegner scores were higher in the ligament augment group. His material was a third generation polyethylene synthetic ligament. It's not on the market here in the United States. There are other material options. You can use auto or allograft to augment it. You can use polyester, which is a strong but non-resorbable material. This is what uh, Dr. Prizel would refer to the non-stretch, or you could use a knitted polyurethane a strong dynamic resorbable, which has a little bit more stretch capability. And what do we know and how can we pick between these options? 
Well, the non-degradable options, these polyester implants, and the prototype for that is the internal brace. They provide immediate mechanical augmentation of the surgical repair. There's no doubt they make it stronger at time zero. They do lose some integrity over time at the junction uh, to the host. And the biggest worry is twofold. One is stress unloading of the repair by the implant is associated with failure. So it's not physiologic. It's not sharing the load with the host tissue. And that's probably my biggest beef with it. The synthetic and degradable, the uh, prototype here is a knitted polyurethane urea copolymer that goes by the uh, trade name of Ardalon. It's non-permanent support with matrix dissolving over five to six years. This is a load sharing dynamic textile. It stretches and it uh, has fabricated patterns to encourage cell infiltration with maintaining structural integrity for repair. So no matter what you're doing, we have to think about what are we trying to achieve? And I'm gonna argue that what we're trying to achieve is a check rain prosthetic concept. And the idea is we're using it as a protection for the brostrum. We want the brostrum to take the load. We want the brostrum to be your day-to-day -day function. We don't want this ligament to take the load. We want it to add more as a check rain. So what follows the risk profile is you over constrain it and you all of a sudden create non-isometry in the joint and that's gonna create problems. And the stiffer the material you are, the higher the risk you're gonna have to provide this over constraint. So let's look at a little bit of uh, uh, data here. So this is uh, Rich Diasa when he was still at uh, Harvard. And what he's looking at is anterior talofibrillar ligament uh, mechanical behavior during pronation, dorsiflexion, as well as supination and pronation. And this ligament elongates and shortens up to 30% during normal range of motion. So I think we'll all argue if we're trying to somewhat replicate that, we need a material that perhaps can do the same thing. Let's take a look at this. So on the right is looking at intact cadaver anterior talofibrillar ligament uh, behavior during tensile loading. And on the left is what uh, we'll call a stretchable ligament augment device. It matches up reasonably close to the native behavior of the anterior talofibrillar ligament. Now let's put these side by side. Stretchy on the left uh, and uh, not stretchy on the right. So a very rigid device on the right and a very flexible one on the left. And you can see that that check rein that doesn't have the ability to stretch drops off a cliff. It loads and then it drops off the cliff and it just does not resemble normal ligament behavior. So where do things fit in my practice? So native ligament repair versus anatomic reconstructions. So my indications where I do something besides or on top of a brostrum is generalized ligament laxity, high BMI, varus hind foot, or if this is revision surgery. The um, <clears throat> PRISP publishing in 2010 was using perineus brevis grafts with an anatomic reconstruction. And he was saying that at 20 degrees, it was superior to brostrum, but be careful, even using this perineus brevis graft is he was, cup, he was uh, interfering with coupled axial rotation. Uh, Miller uh, trying to do this with a little different technique. This is an allograft hamstring, but these are clinical outcomes and the patients did well. So maybe there's a little bit of decoupling going on uh, but at 32 months, patients were doing well with no recurrence. This is where I am in, in 2021. So I'm using an anatomic weave pattern that we're calling the ATLAS technique, and that stands for Artelon Lateral Ankle Stabilization, and we're going to use it in this type of a technique. So we have tunnels in our fibula, we have one in our talus, we have one in our calcaneus, and uh, my technique is I pass it into the fibula first, secure it, I pass it into the talus and fix it. I then pass it into calcaneus and fix it. I fix the calcaneal tunnel, allowing the foot to come to 20% inversion before it tensions. And each one of these tunnels, my graft is fixed with an interference screw. These are, uh, I use peak interference screws. I'm not sure it really matters which interference screw uh, that you use. Uh, our experience is over 200 clinical capable, uh, cases. We've got several papers in development, and this has been an overwhelmingly positive experience for me. And it's simplified my approach to lateral instability because uh, I don't have to rely on the allograft anymore. So I've got my standard brostrum, 
If I need a, if my tissue's not quite good, uh, good enough, I'll do a brochure and I'll augment the anterior talofibrillar ligament. If it's really just not good tissue, then I'll do the Atlas technique. And I've got this material on the shelf and it allows me to really uh, play it out at the day of surgery. So a couple cases just to walk through this. Uh, this on the left is a, a typical uh, varus uh, ankle uh, arthritis patient. Uh, we did a um, uh, in-bone total ankle replacement with a ligament reconstruction on that. Uh, we are uh, looking at our isolated series of in-bone 2 with Artelan, and uh, we're looking at coronal and sagittal uh, x-rays. What we're seeing is, is very good uh, stability with this. Uh, ones that were translated preoperatively, we are able to reduce them back into their joint and hold them. So the question I'd expect you to ask is, can I do the same thing with the brochure? And that's what we're trying to get to here. So this is a bigger study. We've got 40 total ankles, uh, 21 infinity, 13 inbones, six cadence, uh, 25 brochure, 15 uh, atlas. Primary outcome was recurrent instability with a minimum of one year follow-up. Our average follow-up is 20 months. Our preliminary data says they both do well, so we're helping patients, but we are seeing a better and more sustained correction in the ATLAS group. What I mean by that is, is varus reconstruction in total ankles tend to want to settle a little bit back towards varus, and in our ATLAS group, we're seeing less of that tendency. So in summary, chronic lateral ankle instability. Remember the anterior lateral drawer is the most sensitive for ankle instability. The anterior drawer fools you because the subtalar joint uh, comes into play. Imaging cannot guide treatment decisions for chronic lateral ankle instability. The reason to get an MRI is to look for other stuff, not to confirm ligament tear and not to decide if they need surgery or not. Brostrum is effective in patients where there's sufficient healthy tissue. It's still my number one go-to, but Ligament augment, augment devices closely approximate native ATF strength, but be careful of over constraint and pick the augment material carefully, I would argue, for something that's got a little bit of stretchiness to it. Thank you.